Hi, this is Bart Paulson, and this is a lecture for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. This is Chapter 5, Middle Childhood, the second section on Cognitive Development in Middle Childhood. The first thing we want to look at is some of the work done by Jean Piaget on his uh, ability to deal with abstract concepts of what he called operations, and specifically the concrete operational stage. So, for instance, during the concrete operational stage, children resolve many of the cognitive limitations that they had during the pre-operational stage when they were younger. So there's a lot of achievements. These include things like reversibility, decentration, conservation, transitivity, seriation, and class inclusion. And I invite you to look at the book for the definitions of each one of those. Conservation, I will, however, mention, because that's what we have right here in this slide, is particularly interesting because uh, what's going on here is the conservation of volume. This girl is looking and she's got these two uh, balls of Play-Doh and when she squishes the one of them, she's able to say that even though the shape is very different and it's flatter and it's much broader, it is still the same amount of stuff, the conservation of mass. Um, and conservation depends upon something that's a little bit complex cognitively and that's the ability to focus on more than one dimension or factor at a time. Also, the main cognitive limitation at this time is the ability still to think abstractly and scientifically, which is why it's still called concrete operations, because it's still very physical, rooted in the real world, and not the abstract uh, world of ideas. Next, we get to talk a little bit about moral development. Um, and again, the first person we're going to talk about here is Jean Piaget, and Piaget also looked at uh, moral judgments, and he said that uh, the kind of ways that they deal, that children deal with moral judgments, they, they come in two overlapping stages, what he called moral realism and autonomous morality. So in moral realism, which is what our uh, slide is mentioning right here, this is something that starts around the age of five years old, and children consider behavior correct uh, to the extent that it conforms with authority or the rules of the game. So the rules are the rules, the law is the law, and something is good if it deals with the law. Um, they also show the belief of what's called imminent justice, that if you do something wrong, you will get, you'll get hit for it automatically. It's automatic retribution, also instant karma. And this involves the thinking that negative experiences, so when something bad happens, it must be a punishment for a prior misdeed, even when the realistic causal links are absent. You know, And you still see versions of this when people start making all sorts of reasons uh, for natural disasters or terrorist attacks, saying, well, the reason that we had Hurricane Katrina was because there's a lot of drinking in New Orleans. Um, again, an unrelated thing. Um, on the other hand, by, as children get a little older, by the times they're 9 to 11 years old, they begin to show what's called autonomous morality. And in this case, their moral judgments tend to become more self-governed and not just a reflection of existing rules as though they were this uh, written in stone, never changeable thing. Instead, they come to view social rules as social agreements and things that can be changed over time. Um, also, what happens during this stage is what Jean Piaget referred to as decentration. That means really kind of getting around away from yourself as the center of the world and increased empathy. Now, a more complicated uh, program comes from work done by Lawrence Kohlberg. This is a very wordy slide. I encourage you to actually look at this information in more detail in your book. But uh, Lawrence Kohlberg was a researcher who was interested in why people came up with their decisions, not what the, whether something was good or bad, but why it was. And so, for instance, he would give people uh, moral dilemmas. This one right here, you see here, is talking about Heinz, a guy named Heinz stealing a drug. The, the basic dilemma is this. Heinz has a wife. His wife is sick, and she is absolutely for sure going to die unless she gets this one particular drug. The drug is available at the local pharmacist. Heinz lives in a small town, but the pharmacist is charging $2,000 for a drug that's worth $200, so a, you know, a 10 times markup. And so Heinz doesn't have that money. He can't buy the drug, so he can't legally acquire it. However, a situation comes up where it would be very easy for Heinz to steal the drug and get it for his wife. Now, again, this may seem like an artificial situation, but it comes down to this. Heinz steals the drug. His wife lives. Heinz does not steal the drug. His wife dies. And what um, 
Lawrence Kohlberg would ask is whether Heinz should steal the drug or not. And so that lets you know which of these columns their answer is going to go into. But that was not what was of interest. What was of interest is why they said he should do what he should do. And he said, you know, moral reasoning, he says, generally follows the same sequence in children. Yet it can progress at different rates, and not everyone reaches what he calls the highest stage. So the idea here is you have stage one before stage two and so on. He has three general levels. The one at the top he calls level one, that's pre-conventional and begins in early childhood. In the middle, we have level two, conventional moral reasoning in middle childhood. And level three is what he calls post-conventional. And within each one of these, there are two separate stages. So in the pre-conventional level, children are basing their moral judgments on the consequences for themselves of their behavior. Um, it's about obedience and punishment. So for instance, uh, don't take the drug because it's not allowed and you'll get in trouble and or the the uh, pharmacist is breaking the law. Anyhow, um, tends, but it tends to be rather self-focused. Um, at the conventional level, in the middle here, right and wrong are judged by conformity to conventional standards, be they family or religious or just social, uh, conventional standards of right and wrong. And according to stage three, for instance, which is called the good boy, good girl orientation, the idea is behavior is good if it meets the needs and expectations of others, and with the idea that that could shift from situation to situation. But, um, you know, you see here says, uh, Heinz should take the drug or people would blame him for letting his wife die. That would be very bad. Or Heinz should not steal the drug because that would dishonor his family. They they would blame him. So, you know, in both situations, there's, there's blame there, and you don't want that. Um, the third set is post-conventional level. And here, moral reasoning is based on the person's own moral standards. And so um, if the level of reasoning develops here at all, and Kohlberg said it didn't always, it would be found among adolescents and adults. So, for instance, this last one, universal ethical principles, it says, for instance, he should steal the drug because the law comes into conflict with the principle of the sanctity of human life, and that's something that takes precedence. On the other hand, the idea may be here that um, you have to make sacrifices to preserve what you is right, and that may mean he has to let his wife die because it is a virtuous principle to, to not steal. Anyhow, that's Kohlberg. Now, I should let you know there's been a lot of debate, a lot of variation on Kohlberg's work. One of the most interesting was his student, uh, Carol Gilligan, who said that there's sort of a masculine focus to this, and that if you look at it from a feminist perspective, also from the, the role of, for instance, a mother or a caretaker, things might get placed into different orders. And she ended up with some very good research on that, but we're not going to talk about it right now. I am, however, going to talk about information processing. So um, this is where we're, again, we're looking at cognitive development. And the key elements in children's information processing include a few different things. So one is the development of selective attention, where you can focus on what's important and screen out distractions. So for instance, you see here, we've got this test that's looking to mount, uh, for instance, a recall task, a performance task. And you see that when kids are really young, about six, they get really distracted by irrelevant information. And the more ir irrelevant information, the bigger the distraction. And then it goes down. Uh, it drops a lot by the time they're nine, um, around the same at 12, and then it's lower by the time they're adult. And, the, and you can really see that in both cases, they're able to just screen out the stuff that shouldn't be there. So there's the development of selective attention. There's also the development of the capacity of memory and of the understanding of the processes of memory. And then finally, there's the development of the ability to solve problems, for example, by finding the correct formula and then applying it to the, uh, the problem at hand. Now, one thing that can help with learning and remembering is a strategy called elaboration. And elaboration is uh, when a person has to correctly understand the meaning and context of a concept. So the simplest version of this would be, for instance, when you're trying to learn new words, it's putting the word into a sentence. It shows that you understand the meaning of the word, you know when it's appropriate to use it, how it gets parsed in there, and you can use it correctly. And so that's a, uh, something that requires you to elaborate on it in many different ways. Next is about uh, memory. And what we have here is what's called sensory memory and working memory and long-term memory. Sensory memory, sometimes also called just the sensory register, is, is a very short trace of the sensory stimuli before they even uh, start decaying. It, it, it's, it's almost like it's the memory in your ear or in your eyeball before it gets to the brain. It's not exactly like that, but it's an idea. Uh, but very, very brief. Working memory 
uh, is the short-term memory. And that's where you can store information, for instance, up to 30 seconds, unless you are uh, rehearsing it. Um, and the ability to maintain it uh, depends on a lot of strategies, on the capacity to continue. Um, memory function in middle childhood seems largely adult-like in organization and strategies. It shows only quantitative improvement through early adolescence. So you get better at it. It doesn't like change in the sorts of things you're able to do. Just, you know, sort of more, faster, better. Long-term memory, on the other hand, is the great big storehouse of information with names, dates, places, etc. So long-term memories may last days, years, or even an entire lifetime. And in fact, there's no known limit to the amount of information that can be stored in long-term memory. That being said, it's not true that you actually remember everything you ever perceived. All we're saying is that stuff has to be perceived and processed to get in there, uh, at least in some degree. Uh, but there is there doesn't seem to be a, a limit to the amount of room. All right, the next one is about uh, problem solving. And children's knowledge and control of their cognitive abilities, which are involved, for instance, in problem solving, is termed metacognition. The development of metacognition is shown by the presence of the ability to formulate problems, awareness of the processes required to solve a problem, the activation of cognitive strategies, the maintenance of focus on the problem, and things like checking answers. And so meta memory, uh, a similar idea, is one aspect of metacognition, and this refers to a child's awareness of their functioning memory. So older students are more likely to accurately assess their knowledge, and so they store and retrieve information more effectively when it comes time to, for instance, like studying a test. Next thing is about language development and literacy. Um, Reading is a major part of this. Reading involves perceptual, cognitive, linguistic processes and the integration of visual and auditory information. So children must also accurately perceive the sounds in their language and make basic visual discriminations, such as detecting the visual differences between letters such as B and D or P and Q, mirror images of each other. Also, what we have here is that uh, humor, the ability to understand a joke requires um, relatively sophisticated cognitive processes to understand that words could have more than one meaning and that you set up an expectation and then you diverge, you split off to the other meaning. Again, this is opposed to very child humor, you know, just like potty humor or falling down or making faces, which doesn't require this linguistic sophistication. Okay, also reading here. So by the age of six, uh, for most children, the vocabulary is expanded to nearly 10,000 words. Uh, by seven to nine years of age, most children realize that words can have different meanings. So riddles and jokes, like we had in the last slide, uh, that require some semantic sophistication can become entertaining to them. Also, uh, children become more able to form tag questions, showing advances in articulation and the capacity to use complex grammar. They also learn how to use connectives and constructions with indirect objects and direct objects. And that's where we're going to finish this section.